Welcome, everyone. This is the 14th uh, episode of IITT Lectures. It's a series of lectures that's gaining popularity and momentum. And today we're going to talk about transportation geotechnics, another exciting subject. And I'm going to introduce our already renowned speakers by sharing my screen. I cannot find you guys. Let me see. You are there somewhere. Show windows. Yes, now we're talking. Here you are. Can you see the full screen? Yeah, all is good. Yep, it's good. There we Very go. Good. So our speaker, Mike Winter, he's the vice chair of TC202 on transportation geotechnics, which is the subject of uh, this lecture. Uh, we have also with us Errol Tutum Lower. Uh, Editor-in-Chief of Transportation and Geotechnics at Media Past Chair of TC202, Chaturi Arachiji, Postdoctoral Research at University of Technology in Sydney, and Daniel Burrow, a practitioner with Bentley Systems or Plaxis, who's going to talk about modeling, uh, uh, you know, you will see. Um, Embankments, right? Yeah, um, so I'm embankments. not going details. Yeah, I'm not going to go in details in your expertise. They are here for the viewers. You are all in this field better than you know more stuff than me in uh, transportation geotechnics, and I can't wait to hear and listen and learn from you. I'm going to give the floor first to Mike, so I will stop sharing. Mike, it's all yours. Meanwhile, you know, I can tease you with my SMG, Mike. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. President. Um, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of what we do with TC202 and give you a little bit, bit of background to the, the technical committee, but also just to delve in a little bit more deeply about into three of the TC, the task forces within our, our TC in the areas that I'm more interested in. So you can see up here we have a leadership group which is led by our current chairman, Professor Tatsu Tatsuya Ish Ishikawa from Japan. Our immediate past president, as you know, is Errol. And of course, the prior to that was... Antonio. Mike, can you, can you please share your screen? I think uh, oh. we're not seeing it. i selling it, Scott. It's shared. Ah. Okay, so what has happened? And if you can uh, mute uh, the other speakers so we don't get background noise. Right. You are sharing the wrong screen. Yep. That's it. That should All be it. Good. Right. Do you want me to go back this to is the your so it can be edited? Yeah, okay. So as you can see, our current chair is Tatsuya Ishikawa from Japan. As you know, our previous chair was Errol, who's going to be speaking next. And before that, we had Antonio Gomez Correa from Portugal for a very long time indeed. We have 10 task forces. I'm going to speak a little bit about Task Force 1, very briefly about Task Force 6, about the climate effects, and a bit more about geotechnical asset management, which is Task Force 7, and briefly touch upon some of the other things that we do. But you can see there's a real range there. And I think this is one of the beauties of one of the, of the practice technical committees in that we cover almost all areas of geotechnical engineering. We have currently at last count anyway, 86 members from 32 countries. We are perhaps a little bit light in South America. and We're definitely a little bit light in Africa. So if anybody's out there listening and watching, and would like to get involved, please do contact myself or any of the other members of the, the TC. We'd love to have you. But to say, what I'd really like to do is delve in a little bit more deeply. 
and think a little bit about alternative non-traditional geomaterials, recycled materials, byproducts, lightweight materials. And this is our task force that's led by Jennifer Nix from the US. And Chaturi is going to be talking a little bit later about rubber materials in geotechnical engineering. Here you can see some other rubber materials. These are tyre bales, which we used in the UK and the US quite a lot um, from about the early 2000s onwards, seem to have formed a little bit from disuse, from, from use now. Um, but these are very lightweight, very low cost, very efficient means of constructing. And here you can see we're essentially constructing the embankment over an old lake bed, which would have been really problematic using traditional materials. You can also see here embankments formed from pulverized fuel ash, what the rest of the world outside the UK calls fly ash, of course. Uh, we have our own language. We do say about our American colleagues that we are two nations set divided by a common language. And here you can see what is very much a, a local Scottish material where I live. It's something called spent oil shell, which is the byproduct from the production of paraffin, the process that James Paraffin Young invented back in the, the late 1800s. I um, could you go back one slide? Remember, it's interactive, so don't feel offended if we interrupt no, each other. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. uh, to this, for the sake of uh, maybe asking the viewers uh, questions, is it cheaper than geofoam blocks? Much cheaper. Um, essentially, it was a waste material. It's a waste material. So um, end end user product. So. The manufacturers in the UK were putting tyre bales out at about per cubic metre, one sixth to one tenth of the cost of EPS blocks. So, okay, they're considerably wow. what's heavy. The, um, what's the density? Yes. Oh, I knew you were going to ask that, but I can't, it's less than a ton per cubic metre, and that's a metric ton, of course. Um, but what you can do quite readily is tailor the fill you use around the bales so that you're targeting a density of around about one ton per cubic meter. So essentially floating to the same as water. So you can do some quite interesting things. Do you worry about, uh, about floating in times of inundation like geo well this is something or... that has to be part of the detailed design of course you know there are situations okay. where you would ta perhaps target a density of about one or yeah, slightly because... over that there are others where you would specifically target putting a higher density material around the tire bells where you've got the possibility of flooding and inundation to to avoid floating away um, so, th like all things, that there it are looks some like uh, water, water can uh, water can seep through. It doesn't look like it would flow. High, highly permeable. Um, so, what you tend to do is wrap them, so you're not getting too much water inside. But they, and also to, but if you do to also to make sure that you have the flow orientated, so that you're actually passing through the bales rather than settling inside. Interesting. Yeah. So effectively, you can design them like a massive drain. If you wish, um, so there's lots and lots of stories to tell you later. <laughs> Have you? Okay, <laughs> that'll be interesting. I have some stories Sorry as well. To interrupt. Keep going. <laughs> so, just moving on from that, I mean, just a sort of quick aside. I mean, we talk a lot about the circular economy these days, and I'm quite proud of the fact that 20 odd years ago, nearly 25 years ago we were talking about the circular economy and the way in which we deal with um, aggregates in the UK and the construction industry. Now, okay, you can take circular economy back to the Luddites in the, in the 19th century, but it really didn't popularize until about that time. So I think we were pretty pioneering when we were doing that as an industry. So that's aggregates, it's recycling. Uh, so there's lots and lots more we could talk about. We could talk about that all day, but I'd really like to move on to climate and for a long time we've had this tc task force about climate effects on ge geomaterial behavior and unsaturated soils which is really detailed geotechnical engineering and what we did this cycle is we introduced a new task force to build on that a little bit and start looking at geotech oops geotechnical asset management 
geo hazard risk to transport in infrastructure, hazard risk, vulnerability, climate change, resilience, and adaptation. And you can see here some examples of some of our geotechnical assets in the UK. Uh, this is the Canterfort drain, which has suffered quite severe problems. Um, it settles significantly. You can actually see there's a hole at the top there where my colleague's modeling this very nicely for us. We have a wall. Now, this is really a flooding problem. It's adjacent to a major trunk road in the southeast of England. The wall, this wall has almost every single problem you could possibly imagine. It's sagging, it's pushing outwards, it's hogging in another area, it's lost material, it's lost water. We can see here how the interaction of some of our assets with vehicles can be a problem. And we can see here how we need to make sure we've got the right types of materials in the right environment. And this is just a, a type of um, material that's been used in a, in a marine environment, which really probably shouldn't have been. And we can also see here how sometimes we don't really build our assets as well as we might do. This is allegedly a gabion wall or a gabion basket in a gabion wall. Um, absolutely huge particles, but that's caused a, a massive amount of problems. Um, this is essentially to all intents and purpose failed from a serviceability point of view way earlier in its life than it should have done. These are the very detailed things, but we also have the bigger um, issues. And this is a site called the, Eight, the Rest to be Thankful, uh, the Re A83 in Scotland, which I've been working on, I think I first visited the site in about 1991. Um, and it's been a problem all that time, but it's become much more of a problem more recently. We're doing some quite sophisticated monitoring here um, in support of what's a major construction project to try to alleviate the pressure on this road that's caused by significant and repeated debris flow events, the most recent of which was in October last year. So, and this all comes back to how we, as geotechnical engineers, interact with society, interact with government transport operators and so on, or transport authorities and so on, to aid resilience. And if we think about resilience, and this is a diagram that's sort of evolved over a number of years, and if you think of resilience on that y-axis against time on the x-axis, and just think simply in terms of our events, our disturbing events being of constant magnitude, this is really our status quo. So our recurrence time, what the inverse of frequency, of event frequency, if you like, is equal here to our recovery time. So we have a static resilience. We can recover every time something happens. Of course, it's not usually that simple, we usually have something like this. So our recurrence time might be greater than our recovery time. So we have plenty of time to recover. So in theory, we can increase resilience over time. What's happened, I think it's fair to say at the rest of me thankful and a lot of other sites around the world is that we've seen changes in the climate. We've seen more frequent uh, perturbations, more frequent landslides, other events and so on and so forth so that our recovery time becomes less, sorry, our, our occurrence time is less than the recovery time. So each time we have an event, we don't quite recover and we don't recover from the next one. And we don't, so over time we have a decreasing degree of resilience, which is a major problem, as you can imagine. So at some point we have to make a major intervention. There's a number of ways we can do this, of course, and this is a framework we use for understanding vulnerability. If we think about how the risk is the multiply, mul is the hazard multiplied by the elements at risk, multiplied by the vulnerability of those elements at risk. Vulnerability for many, many years has been the neglected area. And it's only the last oops, 15 years or so that we've started to use tools like this. This is these are fragility curves that allow us to assign probabilities of a given level of damage occurrence given a given level of um, event, say, for argument's sake. So, for example, here, let's say a 5,000 cubic metre debris flow event, we can assign a probability of limited damage of around 0.4. And we tested this out a few years ago. Um, we produced some curves. 
We tested it out against the rest to be thankful. We also tested it out against a few sites in the Republic of Korea, South Korea, it's, as it's more commonly known, and it seemed to work fairly well. So some quite powerful tools emerging. And then we also need to think that there at the rest be thankful, we have a quite discreet asset. There's the road, there's some culverts and so on and so forth, and very little else, so it's asset-led. We need to start thinking also in terms of links and nodes. We need to think of routes. So the 83 runs from a place called Tarbot on Loch Lomond to a place called Campbelltown over in the west. We need to think it in that system. We also need to think about the road network. And also we need to think about the transport systems. The first step to this is a little bit of work that I was involved in with my colleague Sotirius Agarudis, um, from, who's now at the University of Brunel. And we started looking at systems of assets. So we could start to combine different asset types and indeed different hazards. So we've got a tunnel there, we've got a big slope there, we've got um, a potential flooding, as flooding geohazard, we've got a landslide geohazard. So we can start to look in a little bit more of a systemized oops, fashion. And we can do this as we have there for high capacity, high speed roads, lower capacity, lower speed roads, where the, the morphology of the infrastructure is somewhat different. And we can also look at lowland and highland areas which obviously in a place like Scotland is very, very important. Switching just briefly before I finish um, from the asset risk to the people risk, we can use quantitative risk assessment techniques. And we can do this on the asset as well. But we can use these sort of diagrams where we've got FN diagrams, if you like, where we've got the annual frequency of F N or more fatalities, F against the number of fatalities. And we can start putting in different sites. So for example, here's a site that I know very well in, again, in Scotland, it's broadly okay. It, the risk sits within the, as low as reasonably practical or broadly acceptable. And here's another site where we're very much in the unacceptable zone and unacceptable for higher numbers of fatalities, which is a big issue. So there's a lot happening in this transportation technique space. There's a lot happening in this particular space. There are a couple of things I'd like to flag up. Um, which I hope will be of great interest to everybody. In November, we will be having our fifth international conference on transportation geotechnics in Sydney, which we're all looking forward to very much. Um, both Harold and I will be speaking at that conference. Um, I'm sure Chaturi Chitur will, will as well. Uh, given you, and you Mark, of course. Yes, mustn't leave yeah. Mr. President out, but I do apologise. But the other thing... I think helps to sort of define the success of RTC is we have this very fine on a lecture after a gentleman called Proctor um, who invented the CBR test, who I remember from the very first days of studying geotechnics at university. Errol's delivered it. Um, the sixth lecture will be delivered in Sydney. Sorry, Errol would, sorry, do apologize. Errol would deliver the fifth in Sydney and the sixth, which is of course to be determined, will be delivered in Vienna in a few years time. The other thing that I should highlight is we have our own journal called Transportation Geotechnics. This has been a massive success. Thanks to Antonio Errol and the other editors. It was launched in 2014 and has actually become one of the biggest, the most major transport, sorry, the most major geotechnical engineering journals we have globally, I think. And the impact factor is pretty high. I'm sure Errol will remind you what it is when he gets, steps up in a moment. And so to finish, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure quite how we do questions, but I'm, I'm always happy to answer them. There's my email. That means anybody can contact me now. Thank you. Is that you uh, lifted by the helicopter? It's not me, but this goes back actually all this, this will be 20 years ago to this year, actually. This is what triggered a lot of landslide and debris flow work in Scotland, a lot of which I've been involved in. So it's been a career defining uh, epoch for me, if you like. Wow. Errol. The floor well, is yours. <laughs> well, Can right. Stop sharing my. <laughs> Very interesting. Let me share my screen here quickly and uh, thank you for giving me the floor, 
Mr. President. It's a uh, pleasure actually being part of this uh, IITT um, interactive technical talk. And I'm a professor here at the University of Illinois at the Urbana-Champaign. Uh, as uh, Mark also mentioned in the beginning, I, I, I was the immediate past chair for about almost nine years, thanks to COVID, one additional year for two terms. So, But my talk will be focused on uh, geosynthetic stabilization of, of subgrade soils and pavement granular layers. And uh, that's uh, actually involved with uh, one of the, uh, one of the, let's see. If I manage to ship the slides here. Were you at the lecture I gave at Urbana Champagne on laterally loaded piles? I oh, there we go. <laughs> when, when was that, uh, Mark? Uh, was that recent? With oh, there we go. When maybe like five years ago. Oh, I see. Probably not. Uh, I can't remember that. <laughs> But we would like, that means we would like to, uh, you know, get, get you, want to host you again here at the University of Illinois. Hopefully you can come back again. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Um, indeed, uh, you're always welcome. And and so the same with all the other uh, participants here. Uh, welcome to the University of Illinois. Uh, great yeah. university. Thanks, I appreciate that. So actually, uh, Mike did a very nice job going over, but of course didn't have enough time to cover all the different tasks. I have been working on uh, stabilization reinforcement aspects of things quite a bit. And this is a slide that uh, shows task force two focus, uh, especially chemical admixture stabilization, which I've been involved with quite a bit. Uh, this is more traditional. At the same time, what we call as mechanical, of course, geosynthetics, which is the topic of my quick uh, presentation today. And I have been uh, working as leader in this area, in this task force with uh, uh, Dr. Song Won Park from, from South Korea. Especially, I would like to focus on, uh, again, uh, geosynthetics, because I think I think there is a lot of benefit of getting geosynthetics more involved in building transportation facilities, roads, infrastructure, ra roads, railroads, uh, roads again, including uh, highway and airfield payments. And uh, actually, uh, I've been really serving as part of the IGS, uh, our sister society, Geosynthetic Societies uh, Council, on that council since 2020 as first publication committee chair. And more recently, uh, the last uh, uh, four-year, I guess, uh, term, 2022 to 2026, is now chairing the TC Technical Committee on Stabilization. So I'm a little bit biased from that perspective to focus my, I guess, talk on uh, geosynthetic stabilization, especially Task Force 2 under TC202. And if you look at this uh, nice picture, by the way, I like to give credit to... Uh, my colleague, Professor Jorge Zornberg from uh, Texas, Austin, that we've been doing short courses quite a bit, talking about uh, how to engineer uh, road infrastructure by using geosynthetics, and especially in different functions. Uh, so many different places you can actually put geosynthetic products for the specific functions listed here. I would like to especially focus on, uh, in this talk, only stabilization known as also stiffening, and, and that's where actually we can we can make uh, extended uh, the duration of service lives for for these uh, roads infrastructure um, facility materials that we build, especially unbound aggregates on soft soils, and how to build them. And that's what I would like to really focus on in this case. So when you think about mechanical stabilization, uh, people in the past consider that as compaction, but compaction is temporary, right? More like inclusions are needed to make mechanical stabilization work. And especially in the areas where uh, the admixture chemical stabilization won't work. Really geogrids, geotextiles, as you can see, are, are the uh, choice geosynthetics used in transportation applications. And of course, uh, fabrics, woven or non-woven geotextiles are, are much less stiff compared to geogrids in general. Geogrids are uh, having a, you know, uh, whole aperture type, you know, uh, holes 
they they really nicely interlock and connect with the aggregates, especially when you install and with somewhat uh, that stiffness, uh, that rigidity, you can actually hold the load much better in, in road infrastructure like that. Of course, what aperture size to match with aggregate particles and, and how to design the ribs and junctions and uh, different types of uh, geosynthetics are there, always different products. That's the hallmark of, of this of the sector and inclusions, I guess. Uh, but but one thing for sure is the rigid inclusions will probably work better, especially if they interlock much better with, with aggregates. So when you look at the technical details, which I don't want to get into a lot, the, the selection of the right aperture sizes and uh, aggregate gradations play a significant role here. Uh, the, or plays a significant role here because, again, it is all matching the right uh, sizes and shapes and, of particles with, with those apertures, uh, apertures in, including maybe triangular or, or rectangular, uh, and, and how the different uh, stiffnesses and junctions or, or rib thicknesses will play a role. But after all, if you want to simplify everything as to how it is going to hold the road with aggregates, going into through the strike tool into apertures, right? There are two main mechanisms. And this applies even in the case of uh, full body geosynthetic, which is fabric, fabric, which is great in separation as well. Friction, frictional resistance is one, but then on, on top of the frictional resistance, what you can achieve by interlocking properly aggregates with, with ge those geograde type reinforcement or stabilization geosynthetics. And especially there are two main applications of this, uh, how to do stabilization applications and holding up better road infrastructure and the construction uh, benefit that we get as well as traffic benefit. One is building on soft subgrades, how to actually increase the bearing capacity now that we can actually build a road on top of a very soft, less than CBR3, Kind of, in, and this can be any type of soil, by the way, as you make them wet. Uh, you can have uh, primarily such soft subgrade in, in any case, right? How to really survive and build, build a road, almost like a payment working platform in this case. The mechanism is to prevent the, the vertical uh, deformation, right? We call that vertical restraint in this case. And, and that mechanism has to be really uh, provided by that structural or friction plus interlocking that we, we talk about, which brings in confinement. But then there will be a lot more deformation in a soft subgrade while, when you're constructing it. There's also what is called the membrane effect. However, all those years of work, we know that unless you get a significant amount of deflection, membrane effect is not the primary mechanism. Primary mechanism is the vertical restraint. In other words, very nice animations here. Uh, I'd like to give more credit to Professor Zornberg here. If you think about the general shear failure in a two-layer system, very soft subgrade, less than CBR3, and now you have aggregate cover, right? The idea is to achieve this general shear failure. But definitely what happens is that uh, there is punching shear, localized shear that's taking place. So in order to prevent this, that that's where actually at the layer interface between base course and subgrade, there comes geosynthetic. And geosynthetic nicely captures now through structural aggregates and, and creates that shear layer for you to hold the load. And, and therefore the vertical restraint that allows you to construct even on salt subgrades, uh, this road infrastructure. So that's really the biggest uh, benefit to us Road reinforcement and stiffening slash stabilization, we call it right. Those two functions come in very handy, but of course uh, there will be some uh, separation infiltration to prevent intermixing of these layers that also happens. But primarily again, stiffening stabilization is, is what happens. This happens surely at the soft subgrade, but uh, also in order to uh, provide stabilization on unbound aggregates, we can further think about this in a paved road construction also for uh, extending the life uh, longevity of that road with, with the geosynthetic inclusion. Uh, with that said, now the main benefit on the soft subgrade application is to increase confinement in the aggregate layer, therefore uh, providing higher, a better shear 
uh, and, and vertical stresses on top of uh, sub rates such that now we have load taken ability load uh, bearing capacity on that soft sub rate. Uh, so that's where the soft sub rate stabilization benefit comes. And uh, there are basically two types of uh, uh, geosynthetic, so to speak. There's a three dimensional version of a geocell that's often used on soft sub grade, as well as the geogrid is more like planar, but then uh, you, you capture aggregate particles through apertures, right? So both, again, help with the principle of providing that shear layer and holding the road for you. The second application that I will talk about, and that's the uh, second one, is coming right after the typical design equation I will show for salt subgrade. That's the bearing capacity improvement again, right? And basically, on soft soil conditions, what kind of aggregate thickness you will build uh, is, is usually governed by a chart like this using bearing capacity uh, considerations on a soft subgrade. Now you can see that those blue color uh, thickness requirements in the case of use of a geosynthetic at that layer interface uh, allows you much uh, less material used. So it's environmentally friendly, sustainable, from that perspective. It's an engineered solution, so to speak. Another engineered solution is in paved roads, how to actually incorporate this kind of a geosynthetic, stabilization geosynthetic in the base or sub-base courses, such that now you, you're extending the life of the pavement that you build, or you're actually uh, maybe decreasing the thickness of the aggregate layers, sometimes substantial, especially in airfield pavements, right? decreasing and then again, uh, make uh, benefit from the uh, cost reduction altogether by the use of geosynthetics. How this works in unbound aggregate stabilization is that uh, you know, typically in a paved road scenario, like a three layer system here, under the wheel load in time, what you will see is that because uh, again, there is the uh, softer subgrade under the aggregate layer, there's gonna be lateral spreading of the aggregate. So, that lateral spreading in time causes degradation of the layer and the modulus goes down. So the idea, again, if, if you provide that, that's exactly what happens, right? The, the focused or concentrated uh, location localized failure. If you provide that shear layer instead, again, the shear layer is highlighted at that interface, which is now that lateral spread is prevented and the main mechanism, therefore, all the rocks in place preventing them from the lateral spreading, lateral restraint. So that indeed is now an unbound aggregate layer application. Uh, you can have only base, or if you have sub-base, these are the proper places to place them in a typical asphalt payment structure. And the way they work is very much similar to sub stabilization, but we're now talking about much less deformations. So what happens then is that with much less deformation, you're really restricting the movement of the aggregates. That provides a local st stiffness increase or stiffening effect that allows us with stiffer uh, layer, actually longer uh, service life or, or more load repetitions extended again, payment life in general. Uh, so, Degradation of that layer because the lateral spreading is prevented is, is actually minimized and that really uh, adds uh, a lot of a lot of engineered uh, benefit to uh, how to design uh, properly long lasting loads roads for you with these unbound aggregate layers. So that being said, my last slide here uh, before I finish is that, uh, is this something that uh, has been really proven out in the field? Yes, it has been proven. How that shear layer really with a geosynthetic, especially a geogrid structure like this, an inclusion like this, how it creates this shear layer to cause a stiffening, local stiffening, therefore holding the material together, right? Uh, minimizing lateral displacements and so forth. If, if you poke, which we did in our 2009 uh, experiment here, if you poke dynamic cone penetrometer into both a geogrid stabilized and then non-geogrid sections, you can clearly see as you go down penetrating into the unbound aggregate layer by the sheer number of blows it takes to reach the same depth, you can clearly see that stiffening that's coming close to where the geogrid is placed in that base B2.
And more recently in our efforts, we have been actually quantifying that by shear wave uh, velocity measurements in a shear wave transducer called Bender Element shear wave transducer. Now we designed it to work in an aggregate layer as well as uh, it's been very commonplace, uh, especially in soil dynamics to use it in soils, uh, fine grain soils in general. But now even in aggregate layers, we are able to measure that small strain stiffness and localized stiffness increase due to geograde inclusion. And we have done that in the recent past. So if you like so far what you heard, uh, here is the preview of what's coming as the fifth Proctor lecture <laughs> at the uh, fifth International Conference on Transportation Geotechnics. And I'll be uh, presenting this uh, geosynthetic stabilization of uh, uh, road pavements, uh, highways, uh, uh, airfield payments, as well as railroad track and geosynthetic stabilization application in November in Sydney, Australia. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Errol. Now I'm more excited to go there. I have many questions for Great. you, but I'm not going to take too much time. Excellent. A couple Looking of stories. To yeah. Looking Between forward to it. And, and all the task forces, I'm really proud of this TC. Thank you so much for the talk and all your efforts. Thank you so much. I uh, yeah. I'll graduated the PhD. I was working for my father, who was a contractor and engineer. And on one project going up in the mountains, these techniques were had ju just started. And I used tire backfill to reduce the thickness of a bridge that was going to be backfilled all around. Right. And uh, I designed it and I reduced the thickness of the concrete walls. And I came with the design as value engineering. Mm -hmm. And my dad kicked me out. <laughs> he said, what are you doing? I get paid per cubic meter. So... <laughs> point of view. I said, dad, you get paid, but it's my reputation for the coming years and it's more important than money and then finally we cut a deal with the engineer who is uh, mm -hmm. uh supervising that they gave us the monk agane means the gain that you would have gotten if you put the mm -hmm. thicker walls so. mm -hmm. and this is what excited me to do more value engineering and on mm -hmm. another occasion other location, we had a very soft ground, even after we put the gravel and the engineer kept on adding gravel. And I was supervising the site. I said, guys, there is this new technique of reinforcing the pavement. And I put mm -hmm. chicken wire. <laughs> wow, well, that's and a wide the... bit. Yes. And the I same... want to tell you, this... Yeah. 23 years ago, and I put galvanized mesh for chicken wire, but I put it between two asphalt layers to protect oh, it from rust. Sure. So it was on top of the gravel. And since then, it, it's been super flat. We use this road. Maybe Dania knows this road going to Hadiza. Yep, some of the stiff geogrids used actually for asphalt uh, pavement, minimizing or retarding or eliminating some of the cracking of asphalt pavements, right? That, that's exactly uh, our uh, use currently of uh, some of these stiff geogrids as well. Yep, same thing. So listening to you brought back these memories that I wanted to share. Chaturi, yes, the floor absolutely. is yours. Probably, hopefully, complementing yeah. what uh, our experts were saying. I like this uh, talk. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I hope uh, you can see my slides. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to show what we are doing at Transport Research Center, University of Technology, Sydney. Um, in today's presentation, um, I would like to present one of our major research areas related to transport geotechnics, um, that is the utilization of recycled rubber in transport geotechnics uh, infrastructures. Um, 
As we all know, uh, the one of the prominent trends of the circular economy is waste recycling. Um, it is identified that more than 30 million tons of tires reach end of life every year, but only 2% of them used in civil engineering and backfilling applications. Most of the used tires are dumped in dump sites, in landfills, causing environmental and health hazards such as um, mosquito breeding and fire hazards. Those are not only affect the um, environment, but also affect the financial hazards as well. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I'm sharing our projects on utilizing these waste tires and conveyor belts in railway infrastructure. Mostly those are coming from the mining industry. The first one is rubber intermixed ballast stratum. Um, that is an alternative material for railway ballast. Um, energy absorbing rubber seam is uh, um, to replace common high density polyethylene geogrease um, used in ballasted railway tracks, just um, as an uh, shock absorber and also to interlock the particles. Uh, into infill tire cell foundation, uh, we call ITCF, to replace traditional capping material of the track formation. Uh, uh, we we process used tires and discarded conveyor belts in three ways to use them in uh, railway applications. Um, one is effective downsizing um, using a conventional tire shredding process. And then uh, we use these rubber granules uh, to prepare according to the design criteria to apply them in the track. Uh, I will explain this process in the next slides. Um, and then the next one is placing whole tire cells in the track. Um, in the capping layer and the other one is uh, to uh, make the uh, discarded conveyor belts into rubber geogrids. Uh, rubber intermixed ballastratum, uh, we call it ribs, is a proportional mixture of ballast aggregates and tire derived rubber granules. Um, after conducting large-scale laboratory experiments, we came up with a particular size range and a proportion of rubber granules that can be mixed with the conventional ballast particles. Uh, the particle size distribution of the uh, material you can see here, that is according to the Australian standard um, that we follow the nominal six degraded ballast specification. And we uh, we conducted the we conducted these um, large scale drain triaxial test at the lab um, following monotonic and cyclic loading test. Um, the specimen size is three hundred millimeter in diameter and the six hundred millimeter in height. Uh, the rubber content we changed up to fifteen percent, and then the results were then compared with the conventional ballast. Here you can see some of the results uh, from my test. Um, we can see the how friction angle and the dilation angle varies with the increased rubber content in the mixture. Due to the slow uh, shear strength of rubber, when we add rubber, the friction angle is decreasing. Uh, but uh, as you know, the uh, normally the friction angle of conventional ballast varies between 46 to 60 degrees. So adding 10 to 15 rubber in the ribs mixture can still satisfy the required shear strength for railway ballast. Uh, reduction in dilation angle is beneficial in ribs because that controls the lateral deformation of the ballast layer. Uh, and here you can see how the ballast breakage is uh, reduced with the increased rubber. Um, uh, due to the applied loads and uh, normally particles are breaking uh, we observed more than 70 percent reduction in the breakage in the large particles when we increased rubber at least um, by five percent um, uh, it is important to control this breakage of these large particles because those are the ones where the most of the loads applied from the superstructure and then uh, this material has a very good energy absorb absorption capacity uh, we observed around 1.3 times of increased energy absorption capacity with the 10% rubber. Because of this um, increased energy absorption capacity of ribs layer, the energy that goes to the below layers will be reduced, um, such as the subgrade and capping. Um, and then we conducted large-scale laboratory tests for energy absorbing rubber seams. Um, we use uh, discarded conveyor belts to manufacture these rubber grids using water jet cutting method. And we did uh, this at the um, Tech Lab of University of Technology, Sydney. Um, it is obvious that the uh, in railways, we experience wheel flats and also rail corrugations. So there's a possibility that the uh, impact loads applied due to the wheel flats 
and the rail corrugations can cause significant damage to the rail infrastructure. So we conducted impact tests on large scale test specimens of ballast with and without rubber grids. Um, the impact force uh, is reduced um, because of the rubber gear grids um, compared to the unreinforced, ba unreinforced ballast. Uh, this is because rubber grids have the flexibility of dissipating uh, shocks while uh, controlling the, uh, the dilation of ballast horizontally. And the next one is the use of rubber tire cells for railways, um, replacing the capping layer. Uh, these tires were first tested at the National Facility for Dynamic High Speed Rail Testing. Um, we prepared the subgrade, and you can see one of my colleagues is preparing the subgrade and putting some instrumentation here. Um, and then uh, after that, we put these old tires systematically in the on top of the subgrade, and then uh, fill up these tires with the uh, demolished granular material. And then we construct the rest of the track uh, as the normal procedure. And there are four um, dynamic load actuators to apply load simulating the real tracks running at uh, very high speeds. Uh, after starting these innovation techniques through large scale experiments, we extended our research to practical applications as well. Um, this is uh, one, of the one of the completed trial track constructed at Chulora Technological Present uh, near Sydney with the collaboration of Sydney Trains and Bristol Corporation and also Ecoflex. Uh, here we constructed four instrumented uh, track sections, each 20 meter long, uh, applying ribs, rubber intermixed ballast and uh, rubber geogrids, and also one with the uh, tire cell track. And also there's a standard track section as well. Uh, for the ribs section, we used uh, recycled rubber granules from a commercial supplier and then mixed them with the ballast aggregates at the site using this volumetric mixer. Um, the, uh, it has the capacity of calibrating up to the required uh, proportion. And then the, from the outlet, we can obtain quite uh, uniform ribs material. Uh, and we place this ribs material on top of the compacted capping, uh, replacing the bottom, bottom ballast layer. And then the uh, rest of the track was constructed at, as usual um, standard procedure. Mm. As shown in this uh, first figure, recycled rubber geogrids placed in between the ballast and the capping layer. And you can see pressure cells and the strain gauges attached to the rubber grids and then the settlement pegs installed. Uh, and then after completion of this track, um, uh, 21 axle load locomotive was used to run back and forth along the, all the track sections to evaluate the track performance. And another 20 meter section uh, constructed with the Infield Tire Cell Foundation. Here we used uh, similar size uh, recycled tires and laid them on top of geotextile and replacing the conventional capping layer of the track formation and then Tires are filled with the granular material that is a uh, waste uh, granular materials obtained from the site and then compacted using this vibratory roller to compact them inside the tires, the tire cells and also around the tire cells. Um, here I'm showing some of the test results from the field trial. The first figure you can see how these vertical pressure distributed along the track formation. There's a sig significant reduction in the pressure at the uh, ballast capping interface uh, in the ribs and uh, the ES tracks. Uh, that is because of the um, energy absorption capacity. And uh, as expected, we observed the increased settlement in these modified track sections um, during the initial loading cycles. Um, that can be because of the uh, slight compression of rubber and then the densification of these granular materials. Uh, and we expect that the in long term, the formation of the track will be comparatively reduced in these modified tracks as well. Um, with, uh, and then uh, we observed the significant reduction in the acceleration uh, in all track sections with a notable decrease in the peak acceleration, which is more than 60%. Uh, 
these observations indicate that the uh, rubber inclusions in the modified track sections reduce vibration better than the standard track, uh, ensuring passenger comfort and also increasing the operational safety. Uh, these are the highlights from my um, my presentation. So the rubber intermix ballast system provides higher energy absorption capacity with lower ballast breakage, uh, thereby increase the uh, track longevity. And infield tire cell foundation reduces uh, track lateral displacement under cyclic loading and increase the resiliency of the track. Energy absorbing rubber seam provides superior interlocking uh, while providing some shock absorption capacity. Um, it's, it acts like a hybrid geogrid plus shock mat. And these projects promote sustainable construction applications by reusing non biodegradable waste and reducing the carbon uh, footprint. So that is all from me today. And um, thank you so much for listening. Katuri, excellent. You are the tire expert. Yeah. <laughs> I've done one uh, tire filled wall, gravity <laughs> wall. I really like, but that was my experience with tires, except the tire shredding uh, backfill, which I like. Excellent work. By the way, did you notice which tire is better, Michelin or Pirelli? Because I always get asked this question. <laughs> I race cars, by the way, as a hobby. <laughs> Daniel, are you ready? Yeah, always ready. Can you see my Where screen? Yes. Coming. Okay. First of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for uh, thank you, Mr. President, for the initiative. Thank you for having me today here. This is a great initiative. Thank you, Professor Mike, Professor Errol, and Chaturi for your interesting presentations. A lot of info useful uh, in that topic and optimizing and uh, developing transportation geotechnics. So thank you a lot for this. Now, let me start my presentation. I'm Daniel Burrow from Bentley Systems. Today, I will talk uh, about an introdu uh, introduction, concept, and equivalent axis symmetric plane strain model setup, then some comparison between Plaxis 2D and 3D. As an introduction, as you may know, now the biggest project around the world are related to transportation. You have the HS2 in the UK, you have the CPK in Poland, you have um, the land bridge in Saudi Arabia. All this transportation projects, so made the, some of them depend on high-speed railways, some of them on highways, some of them on airports, some of them more than one thing. All of them depends on heavily on geotechnics. This is why we are talking about transportation geotechnics. So some of the geotechnical backbones of the transportation projects are like embankments, tunnels, foundation, and retaining structures. Today, we, I will talk about an engineering challenge about a specific one, which is embankment settlement and stability. Why? Because some projects require critical small settlements, like for example, transition uh, zones. So the solution for this is some effective modeling of rigid inclusions. As a general illustration, let's talk a little bit. Well, you can see up a load. This load you know, can be a high-speed railway, a railway, a highway. For example, below it, you will find an embankment that was embankment and under it, a load transfer platform. We will note it as LTP for the future. Uh, slides. And after it, we have also some rigid inclusions, which will be noted as RI, and of course, some soils. The concept. Here you can see some plan section, radial section, a section, and some 3D. You know, uh, we, as the LTP will, will try to uh, the, give all the load to the rigid inclusions, or most of the load, and 
uh, we will what we will try we will try to calibrate the modeling approach by calibrating an axisymmetric uh, model with a plane strain okay the axisymmetric model influence zone will be pi r square this is a rigid inclusion and in its influence zone and the influence zone of the um, plane strain model will be uh, as as as, 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 as stands for spacing okay so now let's talk more about it for example the axis symmetric model will be modeled as clusters the rigid inclusion will model as a cluster then we will define the soil parameters for the embankment the ltp and the soils then we will find the axial forces and axial skin resistance and settlements that will be used to calibrate our plane strain model in the plane strain model we will use an embedded beam, it will be a, a little bit different in the approach. We will use an embedded beam, but the the uh, uh, with the info in this embedded beam will be taken from the axis symmetrical model. Then we will also uh, take care of the load uh, pl plat uh, LTP to take better uh, transfer of load by uh, doing a small trick, uh, which is uh, en enlarging or extending the embedded beam to the inside and setting some top connections. Here you can see that we are depending on the radial layout and here on a plane, uh, uh, on a plan one. Okay, we will use the same spacing, a uniform spacing. To, the, uh, to talk more about the calibration, here we can see an embedded beam uh, row in plexus where we took the axial skin resistance from the axis symmetrical model. And we will try to calibrate it partially using the interface stiffness factor to get uh, the models to have same results, to give us a, a good uh, results. Let me give you an example. This example was used by Menar. Menar uh, used in a Plaxis webinar, Master Region Inclusion with Plaxis on Virtuosity. As you know, uh, Menar, is a company that uh, has uh, 80 branch uh, around the world. Okay, so the, as you can see here, the plane strain, oh, sorry, the axis symmetric settlement was 0, uh, 0.037, and is the plane strain, it was 0 0.036. So with that calibration, as you can see, it took almost the same settlement. And in axial forces, it was the same. To go deeper, inside of it, also a 2D model and a 3D model comparison was done by the Menar in the Virtuosity webinar. So the Plaxis 2D plane strain from one side and a Plaxis 3D from the other side. If you can see the vertical displacement in the, pla uh, in the Plaxis 2D was 48 millimeters and in the uh, 3D was around 43. Now, uh, the, here we will speak about the horizontal displacements that it took in the Plaxis 2D, it was 23 millimeters. And in the, uh, in the other one, the Plaxis 3D, what was 18 millimeters. The bending moment here, of course, it was multiplied by spacing because it's a plane strain. And you can see that the shape of the bending moment was the same. It was five kilonewton per meter. And in the Plaxis 3D, it was 4.1. Then the axial forces, it's also in the same approach multiplied by spacing, it gave a 311, 311 and in the plexus 3D, it gave, it gave 326. So as a conclusion, uh, the 3D modeling approach is an adequate analysis method for any situation. And 2D modeling is also an option when applicable. But the calibration is the key for, its for this simplification. In addition to this, in-situ testing and monitoring are essentials for a safe and optimized design during construction and after it. Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, I tried to fin finalize this great uh, uh, in IT IITT in a quick way so we can be as schedule. Yeah, yeah, doctor. You made it on time. Perfect. I love your conclusion. Thank you a lot. Institute sir. testing and monitoring and engineering judgment are key for a safe, optimized design.
Yeah, of course. Beautiful. Just uh, to to give you a side uh, story, when I was a PhD student, we ran a class A project uh, and um, where we did five shallow footings and we mm -hmm. sent to about uh, 120 consultants around the world the soil data and the geometry and we asked them to predict the low settlement curve. Mm -hmm. The best uh, prediction at the time, where there was no plexus, it was abacus. <laughs> uh -huh. The best prediction was using, he hit it right there, comparing theoretical prediction to actual measurements, static load test. It was abacus finite element. Do you know what was the worst prediction? Uh -huh. Also uh -huh. abacus. <laughs> So I'm glad <laughs> to are here to as an expert to guide us because if I use Plaxis, I have to really use all my engineering judgment to, to feel comfortable. Very powerful tool. It has to be in safe hands. Thank you all. Yeah, but this we always need the engineering judgment, uh, our engineering judgment, as you said it. Yes. Thank you so much, Mike, Errol, Chaturi, Daniel. This has been a great um, uh, interactive talk. I think we're going to see many, many viewers. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, you will know because we uh, advertise it on all our social media as ISSMGE. I don't know if you want to add anything before we close this uh, lecture or... Uh, Talk. I think it's great to hear everyone's, uh, you know, presentations and, uh, well, in, in on top of that, uh, it's it's been a pleasure actually uh, to work in transportation geotech area and, and, and as part of this TC, I, I, th I think TC202 in general, I, I need to mention that is, is up to a lot of good, good work and, and please all the, uh, um, Viewers here, uh, please consider attending in the uh, fifth uh, ICTG conference coming up in Sydney, Australia this November. It will be a great venue for sure. Should, the president will be there. Yes. <laughs> I'll endorse all that Errol said and add the bit I couldn't remember earlier that the other one of our great successes, the Transportation Geotechnics Journal, its impact factor for last year is now 5.3. Now, that's great for the academics, for those practitioners like myself, Mark and Daniel. Less important, but it's still a sign of great success. And I think that's one of the other great successes of TC202. We have a really nice mix between academics, people from government and people from industry who work very well and very closely that's together. That's right. That's right. And, and definitely feel the major gap there. This, this area has been... Uh, I guess not considered under traditional uh, geotechnical engineering for a long time, and now we have this field very nicely established. Yeah. So, yep. Katuri, are you going to be in Sydney at the conference? You're muted. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course, from here. Yeah. I'll be yeah. there. So we'll see you in because person. Because it's organized there. by UTS, and I'm a part of the <laughs> technical committee as well. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, see, see you, see you all then in Sydney, except Daniel. Daniel, you should do an effort to be there since we're all going to be there. Let's and try. All our viewers are invited, yeah. of course. And I Thank wish you, you so much. more success in uh, in the, your future IIT uh, ones. From one success to another, Doctor Professor. It was nice to meet you all. And thank you for your presentations and for all your valuable info. I Same. want to say goodbye. I am you Mark Belloons, president of ISSMGE. And see you on the next episode. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.